Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's good to see you all this morning. My name is Matt. I'm one of the associate pastors here. I'm so glad to be with you this morning. Look around. St. Patrick's Day. Is somebody close to you not wearing green? Don't pinch them, you weirdo. <laughs> this is not, that's where we take people as they are, remember? No. <laughs> We're so glad that you're here with us in this place. If it's your first time, if it's if you've just, or if you've been here for a long time, you are welcome in this place. You're welcome with your curiosities, your questions, your struggles, and your celebrations. All people are welcome in this place. Not because we say it, because God says it. We love having all ages in worship, or worship with us today, but we want you to know if few things are available if you, need, if you decide you need them. We, uh, we have all kinds of stuff at the back of the room for kids to, to help. We have our amazing student section. Let me hear you. They're, they're not awake yet. Um, <laughs> then also, if you go out these doors and around here, we have our wiggle room and our mother's room. There are all kinds of ways for you to worship this morning. Um, please feel free to, as you need to, use this space um, to move around and just um, find a way to worship that best suits how you are interacting with God today. It is the fifth week of our series, Practice Makes Purpose. We're very excited to explore the ways that practices help us to engage with our faith. As we start today, I hope you will uh, find an attitude that helps you um, enter into a time of prayer with me. Lord, be with us this day as we commit ourselves to being your disciples. Help us to face the future unafraid, trusting in your love and care and presence with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand up for worship today, will you make sure that everybody around you feels welcome? Good morning, church. My name is Scott. This is Preston and Andrea. We're going to lead you in worship today. We invite you to sing this wonderful hymn with us this morning. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be As we've been talking about our, um, our, the ways in which we practice, we, one of the ways we're going to be talking about today is corporate practices, so practices we do together. I want you to think about something real quick with me. Um, I want you to think about one thing that um, it can be small or it can be bigger or it can be really big. One thing that you need prayer for. I want you to think about that right now. You got something? I bet every one of us came in here with something. Could be good, could be bad, could be something you're struggling with, could be something you're um, kind of trying to work out. As you have that, as you feel comfortable, 
turn to someone around you. It can be someone you came with, or it can be someone that you didn't come with. Maybe there's somebody next to you that you've never met before. If your thing was too personal and you're not ready to share that, that's okay. But if you want to, you want to try something together, turn to somebody around you and tell them what that prayer that you thought of was. Go ahead and do that now. Now, if you if you if you, if you want to turn to the person on the other side of you and hear what their prayer is and tell them what yours is. Prayer is something that can be that can be really difficult. It can feel odd. It can feel like we're insufficient. It can feel like we don't have all the words to put together. It can feel like um, God maybe isn't listening. But we're promised that every time we offer up a prayer, no matter what that is, that God hears it. Just like the person next to you heard what you are going through or something fun in your life, that's how God hears our prayers. So today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer up a small prayer. And then in the middle of this, I'm going to leave a space for silence. And in that space for silence, I'd like you to offer up one to three prayers. Yours, and the person on your left, and the person on your right. We're going to pray together. God, thank you for hearing us. Wherever we are, however we've been, um, whatever we come in with, whatever, wherever we are, even outside of this room, in, um, in a bus, in a car, on, in our classroom, in our place of work, wherever we are, you hear us. And God, we are so grateful. How freeing is it to be able to lift our prayers to a friend, to place our prayer with someone else, knowing that they can hold it. God, we use that today to remember that you can hold all of our prayers. You can hold all of it and take it on and you hear them. So in this moment, we place the prayers of our hearts and the prayers of our neighbors in your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. What an amazing thing it is that you are with us. No matter what we have, God, we thank you for the freedom in the ask, the freedom in the prayer. Thank you for this time. Amen. Oh, thank you for that. I hope that was helpful for you this morning. We're going we're gonna to transition into a time for our kiddos. Do you know what time it is? The beacons are lit. <laughs> you guys can head out to your small groups. We're so glad you worshiped with us today. Hope you got to hear some fun prayers. I hope somebody prayed for you this morning too. Have a great time. You're going to love it. It's a lot of green.
As you're sitting there in your chairs around you, um, or when you came in, you got a card. On that card is a QR code. I really hope you take a second to scan that. You're going to see our link tree, and we have all kinds of ways that you can um, connect. But one of, the be- one of the best ways to do that is to sign in is to just let us know that you are here and you just click that button and put your, and put your name in if you've been here before and put a couple things in if you're, if you're new. But we really want to get people connected in this place. We really want you to know that you have a home here. And so we hope you will do that as we continue in worship today. Search the world, it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied Hearing your love Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you, Lord There's nothing, nothing is better than you Turn seas into high 
Right now, it's still kind of chilly out there. Temperatures staying in the high Treasuries 40s. Treasuries rose early. Tomorrow's Welcome to Platwood Church. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here. It is good to be gathered together, as Pastor Matt said, both here in this room, but also with those of you joining us online this morning. My younger son, Laz, who is eight, is preparing for a piano recital this week. He was practicing his piece, Let's Go Fly a Kite, from Mary Poppins, and I sat down earlier in the week to play the accompaniment part with him. This stirred up a memory for him from the holiday recital of the woman who accompanied all the students, some on piano, some vocalist, some instrumental. And to Laz, it appeared that she simply materialized out of nowhere. He had never met her before. And without batting an eye, she sat down at the keyboard and just played whatever needed to be played. So he was remembering that. And he asked me incredulously, Mama, how did she do that? How can someone not even practice and just sit down and play? (laughs) And I tried to match his earnestness by saying that just because he didn't see her practice didn't mean she hadn't. And I bet she also has practiced piano so much over the course of her life that she already knows a lot of those songs that she accompanies, and she can just sit down and play them. Her hands and her brain have memory, so they do what they need to do when they need to do it. Our repetition, our practice of a thing shapes us and changes us in the moments that we are practicing, of course, but it also shapes us for the times that are coming, the moments we can't predict when we're going to need to know just what to do and not try to figure it out as events are unfolding. I think about this a lot with first responders or pilots or military personnel. Their practice of their skill is drilled over and over and over because in times of chaos or trauma or emergency, they don't have time to go read a book about engine failure or search up on Google how to staunch a bleeding wound. Their reflexes just kick in. They've practiced so they just know what to do and they do it. This series during Lent, Practice Makes Purpose, has been intended to build some of these kinds of instincts in our hearts. What spiritual practices can we learn and try and repeat that will shape our instincts so that when we're in a situation where we don't know what to do, we actually do know what to do. Our reflex to fear, for example, becomes prayer. Our response to tragedy becomes service. Our instinct in chaos can be solitude. And over these weeks, we've explored some spiritual practices that are highlighted in a book called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. There are more practices out there than what we've named, but his work is probably the best starting point for us, at least written in recent history. We've explored our airplane mode practices, inward practices like meditation and prayer, study and fasting. We've talked about our Wi-Fi practices, our outward practices that connect to others and the world, like simplicity and solitude and service. And then today, we will look at our Bluetooth practices, the things we do together with the people right around us in our church community. We call these, as Matt said, our corporate practices, or the practices of the body, the things we all do together. They are things like worship, guidance, and celebration. So let's begin with worship. We're all already here. (laughs) Our scripture is full of calls to worship, proclamations for God's people to gather and offer ourselves, our praise, our thanksgiving, our humility before God. We are made to reflect our maker. And our worship is the act that demonstrates that we know we remember where we came from. 
It sets our hearts in the proper place, reminding us and everyone around us that God is God and we are not. In the book of Acts, we read this description of the first Christian communities as they gathered together. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day, they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. They heard the apostles' teachings. They prayed and sang together. They shared food. They gave money and resources. They cared for the poor. They offered themselves into God's community because they understood that together they were that reflection of God's image, not apart. Gathered together, they were greater than the sum of their parts and they radiated something of the divine out into the world. When we gather for worship together and we do all of these really strange things, we are forming ourselves in a way that is different from the rest of the world. We are reflecting a fuller image of the one who made us. The world would have us worship a whole long list of other things. Money, fame, glamour, ourselves, security and safety, a particular ideology, national identity, beauty, power. There's no end to what the world entices us to worship. And there's a word for that. When the object of our devotion is anything other than God... It's a big word. It's idolatry. The world values idolatry. It sells it to us at every turn, convinces us of so many things that are the most important thing in our lives, or should be. But when we, together, make worship a practice in our spiritual lives, we are exercising our muscles to resist the pull toward idolatry. We are stating with our presence, with our songs, with our prayers and our hearts that God and God alone deserves our worship and devotion. There's something else that happens when we gather to worship God. Where the world values or cherishes even individualism, self above all else, worship forms us instead for community. It draws us into a space where we remember what we need from one another, and what we have to offer. We are made into one body. Our singing does this, and the words that we pray together, we align our very breath and sound and words. The sounds that we lift up are greater than the sounds we can make on our own. Breathing together creates something mystical that invites us both with each other and with the spirit of God. We become united in that spirit. Just try it. Let's just breathe together. Ready? Breathe in. Even if we don't know every person who is sitting next to us or behind us or worshiping online with us, I remind people that when we enter enter into this common space together, we are suddenly carrying everything that came in with every person together We just prayed that way moments ago. No one has to carry their stuff alone anymore when we worship as a body. When you walk in the door, you may be coming in off the best weekend of your life. Your heart may be overflowing with gratitude and praise for how amazing and awesome God is. You belt out every song at the top of your lungs and every prayer because today you can. But there's someone else in the room who dragged themselves here today, almost didn't even come. Their heart is shattered, their mind is weary, their body is in pain. They can't bring themselves to utter a single word or form the smallest prayer. They need someone else to do it for them. And because we're together, someone does, whether they know it or not. 
And so any time we gather to worship, then we know that when we sing with others, sometimes we're singing for others. And in return, we know that when we're the ones who cannot pray, someone will be here to pray for us. When you are here, it makes a difference. It matters to God and it matters to someone else. When you are not here, the same thing is true. Worship forms us as a body. We do not go it alone in following Jesus. And when we practice worship together, we show up with all that we are, including an expectation and an anticipation that the Spirit of God is going to show up here too. The second practice we'll talk about today is the spiritual practice of guidance. And this is one that is interesting to think about as a corporate practice. We more naturally think about how the Spirit guides us as individuals. We seek promptings. We search for insight and direction from God in our lives. We want to know more deeply the way that God wants us to go as individuals. And this is certainly a reality of the spiritual life. We can perceive and discern God's guidance in our individual lives. We see examples of that in our scripture too. But something we also see in scripture is God's guidance of entire groups of people. The central narrative of the Old Testament, the Exodus, is God's guiding not one person, but an entire people from captivity to freedom. In the New Testament, Jesus doesn't just have one disciple, he has 12, probably more. It seems there is something to groups of people trusting the Spirit and moving along a journey together that is important for us to seek even now. A few weeks ago, I was in Phoenix with a group of pastors. I've mentioned this already in this series and in an e-note. You might be tired of hearing about it, but I got a lot of ministry mileage out of those three days. One of the afternoons had been left open to us as free time so that we wouldn't spend the entire time in a windowless conference room. And about 25 of us signed up for a desert hike in the McDowell Mountains. Tom's Thumb Trail was the name of it. We loaded into a bus, this whole gaggle of United Methodist pastors, and a woman named Becky had welcomed us onto the bus. And during this 45 minute drive, she stood at the front and she told us about the area, about the cactus, something about the history, the weather of this part of the country. She told us what to expect on the trail, how much water to drink before we even got off the bus. She answered a few questions here and there, and I assumed that she had been hired as the hiking guide for the day through some local tour company. As we approached the trailhead, though, she suddenly stood up on the bus and announced to us, okay, everyone, just so you know, I'm not a real guide. I mean, I hike these mountains every week, and I've done so for the past 20 years, but I'm not a real guide. I just go to a Methodist church out here, and I wanted to help you all out. <laughs> I'm sure she was trying to lower our expectations and also not be held liable in case one of us needed to be airlifted out. But at the end of the day, Becky, our not guide, was a pretty exceptional guide for this group that left unattended would certainly have sustained injuries and dehydration and perhaps been scavenged by vultures before it was all over. For not being a guide, 20 years of hiking the same trails, the same hills, over and over, gave Becky a knowledge that we did not have. She knew the plants to avoid, what part of the path to walk on, not to step on the gravelly stuff going downhill, which muscles of our legs to use on the inclines, and she knew how fast we were going to have to go to get back to the bus in time. Becky set the pace. Becky shouted the encouragement. Becky knew where to stop to rest. And Becky got all 25 of us to Tom's thumb and back faster than any of us thought we could go. <laughs> but what also made us work, made this work, wasn't just Becky. It was a group of people, people who incidentally lead other people as part of their daily job, who were willing to be led. We knew we needed a guide. We needed someone who knew the journey ahead, and we were willing to follow together. It was also a group of people committed to sticking together. 
We separated out a bit, just based on speed, but no one ever walked alone. And when someone struggled or needed a break, others helped and encouraged. If someone slipped, there was always a hand right away. When someone wanted a picture taken, there was always a willing companion. When we enter into the corporate practice of guidance, we recognize that we need someone who knows the spiritual terrain better than we do. We seek out those that fit that description. We commit to the others in the group that we are in it together. We're not it on our own. We don't have all the answers. And there's a humility inherent in submitting to the greater good of the group and listening and learning and discerning together what the Spirit would say to us. Guidance as a practice can look a lot of different ways. It can be with a spiritual director. It can be through large groups gathering together. But the easiest illustration, particularly in our, our church, might be our grow groups, perhaps the Sunday school class. These are the groups designed to do this work together. These smaller groups within our community are meant to be the crucible in which we seek God's guidance together. We learn in listening to one another how we ought to listen for the Holy Spirit. We learn to desire what God desires for the whole group, not simply what is good for ourselves. And we learn from others who have been at this Christian life longer than we have. They know the trails. They have the experience that we need to understand. Where in your life are you seeking God's guidance? Are you doing it all on your own? Or do you have a body of people that you're a part of seeking to be faithful together? The final practice that we'll explore today is celebration. Celebration is what brings joy into life. And we've said each week that each of these practices is not meant to weigh us down or send us into melancholy or boredom. The practice's aim is joy, and their end is joy. Jesus' entire life was wrapped up and packaged in joy. What did the angels say in the Gospel of Luke the night he was born? Do you remember? Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And then toward the end, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Jesus is preparing to leave his disciples and his bequest to them is joy. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. When he begins his public ministry, he reads from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he proclaims the year of Jubilee. His first miracle in the Gospel of John happens at a wedding where the whole celebration is in jeopardy because the wine has run out. Jesus is a joy bringer, which means our creator intends joy and celebration for us. Celebration, though, may feel harder to come by these days. Life in the modern world has a strong tendency to suck the joy right out of us. For so many generations, we've been pressed to be useful and rational. Those are the qualities that make the world turn, that make society tick. How utterly dull. Perhaps the first and foremost reason for Christians to practice celebration together is simply to not be so boring. Do you see the speaker array behind the table there? I, I didn't make this graphic. Adam made this graphic. I think it's hilarious. Of all people, people following Jesus should be free, alive, interesting. And the practice of celebration adds festivity and hilarity, lightness to our lives. It saves us from taking ourselves too seriously. Celebration also sets right our perspective. It brings everyone to the same level. When we celebrate, we let go of so many of our inhibitions. We quit worrying what others will think because everyone is looking through the eyes of joy. Foster, in his book, describes the leveled playing field this way. He says, in celebration, the high and mighty regain their balance and the weak and lowly receive new stature. Who can be high or low at the festival of God? 
Together, the rich and the poor, the powerful and the powerless all celebrate the glory and wonder of God. Celebration also leads to more celebration. As we exercise this muscle, we find that joy simply begets more joy. Over time, we become joyful people eager and willing to celebrate both the small wonders and the big festivals. These acts of celebration aren't with a deaf ear to the suffering of the world. Instead, practicing celebration is a spiritual act of defiance and resistance against the pain. Celebration insists on God's goodness and faithfulness over and against and in the midst of the struggle. One of my most favorite hymns is an early American folk song. The lyrics were written by a woman whose last name we don't even know, but her words speak to this persistence in celebration in spite of all the storms that rage. You might know it. Pete Seeger did it back in the 60s or 70s. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the sweet, though far off hymn that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Celebration makes us strong. We persist, whatever comes our way. And just what does celebration look like in a family of faith? We don't have to do much to explain this one. We just have to watch the children. What do children do when they celebrate? They make noise. They move their bodies and jump and dance. They laugh. They do whatever their spirit and the spirit compels them to do. And they don't care what anyone else thinks. The result is that other children join them, and a space opens up for anyone to enter into the celebration. What could that look like as a corporate practice? How do we more freely celebrate God's presence and goodness in our life together? One way that we try to live into this practice here on staff at Platte Woods is through storytelling. At nearly every staff meeting, we try to end with a time of celebrations. We reflect together on where we have experienced God's presence in our own lives, in our ministry, in the ministry of our church, in the community that we serve. This has even turned into a channel on Microsoft Teams that we share. We can share the photos and the stories during the week, even if there's no staff meeting. And the more we share these stories, these celebrations together, the better we become at noticing God's goodness all around us and celebrating it. The more we tell it, the more we see it. We also have opportunities week in and week out to celebrate together on Sundays. It's part of why we gather for worship. These two things are connected. But even throughout the year, we lean in especially to the festivals, to the high holy days, for example, Our ritual festivals that the calendar gives us to mark human time with God's time, with God's story. And we're rolling into just such a time this next week. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and our entire theme for the day is celebration. It's not a coincidence. My hope is that you feel it when your feet hit the parking lot. We will be full of levity and festivity, free to move about and dance if you want to and sing. No one's going to look at you funny if you want to wave a palm in the parade with the kids as they go through. If you are overcome with God's spirit at the sight of your church coming together to serve your neighbors in need, and you need to do a cartwheel in the hallway, or you need to let out a shout, you have my full permission right now. It is our practice to set apart days and holidays to celebrate together because God is always up to good things when people gather in God's name. It delights God when we notice and respond with joy. Practice doesn't make perfect. There is freedom in releasing that perfection as our goal in our spiritual lives But these practices that we study and learn and then repeat in our lives do shape us. 
They train us. They mold us into people of spiritual depth, people with a purpose of knowing and loving ourselves deeply because our inward practices attune us to how God knows and loves us. People with a purpose of seeing and hearing and loving others because our outward practices set us into right relationship with those we encounter. And people with a purpose of togetherness in a world that creates isolation because our corporate practices draw us into the presence of God together. May God honor our commitment to these practices, whether they are new to us or old habits already. And may they change us and mold us in the ordinary days and ready us and steady us for the moments we will need them most. Will you pray with me? God, you are the ground of life, guide of your people, and giver of every joy. In our life together, as people seeking your way, draw our hearts to worship of you and you alone. Open our hearts to seek and follow your spirit as guide. Fill our hearts with every celebration of your great love and your good works in and all around us. May our practices together grow us and strengthen us to be the kind of people this world longs for and needs. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Each week as we respond to God's word in our lives, God's spirit at work within us, we come together and we practice generosity. This is a muscle that we exercise, letting go of things that are ours for the sake of God's work in our community and throughout the world here at Platwoods Church. So during this next song, it's a time of offering. It's a time for you to consider how you might let go, how you might give and practice generosity here in this church community. So many of you do that regularly to support and sustain our ministry here. Some of you have um, stepped out in giving for the first time and still are learning how to grow in that practice, and others have never given before, but I invite you to take a step. The easiest first step is electronically. You'll see that information online for how you can make a simple gift to Platwoods Church. Um, There are other ways to give as well if you want to scan the QR code. But may God bless our generosity together. May God's spirit do a work in your heart as you offer your gifts to God today. For this day, we've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, feeling every part of our prayers. Church, let's stand and sing together. Your presence in this place, you've gathered in your face. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Would unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see 
your power show us show us your glory lord show us show us your glory show us show us your power show us show us your glory lord close our time of worship and celebration today, I want to invite everyone here to take a next step. First of all, for those of you who are new with us today, if it was your very first time here at Platwoods, um, thank you for being our guest. I hope that you will just take a moment and connect with us after worship. You can stop by our welcome desk. You'll meet Michael out there. He has a gift for you just to say thanks for being our guest here today. And I hope you'll come back and join us again uh, next Sunday for our week of celebration. Also, for everyone here, um, don't forget to stop by our practice corner. We have set that up down at the end of this hallway for this entire season where we've given you tools, ways to enter into these spiritual practices we've named every day, every week. So if you haven't been down there yet, it's not too late. You can still go. And today, Candace has um, a celebration practice for us. It's a really cool little sticker. You can put your celebration up on the wall. It's really lovely. So please, please take a moment. It's there for all ages. Everyone can participate in our practice corner down the hallway. Next Sunday, as I mentioned, I'll tell you a little bit, about, a little bit more about that, is our Palm Sunday Celebration Sunday. We are going to be celebrating all morning long in so many different ways. So starting, starting at 9.30 all the way through to noon, maybe plan to spend a little more time at church next Sunday because you're not going to want to miss it. We'll have lots of fun in worship together. We'll have our Palm Parade. Again, the kids lead us, but grownups, like, jump in. It's so fun. Grab a palm. Let's go. <laughs> we'll have our processional. We will have, um, there's a prayer labyrinth, a way for you to experience prayer in a different way. We're going to have donuts, I heard. There's an Easter egg hunt for the kids. So all of these things, a way of serving. Uh, we'll be packing hygiene kits for, um, it is called Heart to Heart International. So this is crisis response all over the world. We're going to prepare as many hygiene kits as we can uh, to send into those places that need them. Um, so come sign. I don't think you have to, have to sign up. Just show up um, to help serve next Sunday morning. If you're not going to be here because of spring break, you can still participate in that um, service project. If you'd like to, you can scan the QR code, um, go and make a donation, a $5 donation, and just put the note hygiene. Um, that will let us know that you want to sponsor a hygiene kit. They're five bucks a piece. So if you'd like to participate in that way, you can do that as well. Um, it's going to be an incredible morning. You're not going to want to miss it. So come and be ready to celebrate. Then, of course, uh, that leads us into Holy Week. Um, there's a lot of things happening during Holy Week. We will have our two Holy Week services on Monday, Thursday, and then Good Friday. Those are both at 6.30 p.m. They'll be in our sanctuary worship space. Uh, but I invite you to come to those, uh, those special times of worship that help us walk through the story of Jesus last week of life that leads us up to Easter. It's a great way to prepare your hearts uh, for the Easter celebration as well. And then Easter Sunday morning, we will be here in this room for three different services, 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m., and 11 a.m. All the services will be exactly the same, so you can choose according to your schedule. For those of you used to worshiping at 9.30, I see you. I respect that. I also expect there will be a lot of people for the 9.30 service. So um, a lot of folks coming maybe for the very first time or coming back for the first time after a long time. If 8 o'clock or 11 o'clock works great for you, maybe think about going to one of those so we have enough seats for everybody. <laughs> but just uh, think about how your morning's going to play out. Invite someone to join you. Most importantly, we will have room for everyone. So I want you to bring friends and family. But just think about how that morning might shake out. It's always fun turning people around in this building in 90 minutes. So good times. I can't wait for Easter. It's going to be a huge day of celebration, a way we can practice that corporate practice together, if you will. I invite you now um, to rise and receive God's blessing as you go forth.
May Jesus be our guide as we step into hard places with courage and curiosity. And may our path be one of belonging together and full life in Jesus Christ. Go in his peace. Amen. Amen.